welcome to the Serious Leisure podcast, where we bring you fascinating and inspiring stories about engaging with leisure seriously. We reflect on our struggles and our successes with balancing our leisure, work and well-being. My name is Petya Petrova. I'm your host for today's podcast. I'm joined by our regular podcast contributors, Dr. Sam Elkington from Teesside University. Sam is our serious leisure expert. Welcome, Sam. Hello, Petia, and good afternoon, everybody. We are also joined by my colleague, Kat Branch. Kat leads our University of the West of England Center for Music. Welcome, Kat. Hello, everyone. For those of you new to the podcast, welcome. And thank you for joining us. You may notice that we often abbreviate the University of the West of England to EUE. We are very excited to welcome today our two podcast guests, Jarek Turif, Senior Lecturer, Learning Disabilities Nursing at our newly launched School of Health and Social Wellbeing here at EUE. Welcome, Jarek. Hi, Petya. Good afternoon, everyone. For our regular listeners, today is our first cross-institutional collaboration with colleagues from Sam's University. We are very excited to welcome our first external guest, Sharon Gator from Teesside University. Sharon is a lecturer in Teesside Business School and a sports scientist. Welcome, Sharon. Hello, everyone. So, Sharon and Yarek, before we proceed to talk about your um, interesting, fascinating, and quite impressive serious leisure pursuit. Um, can you just give our guests a little bit of background about what your roles, professional roles involve? So if we start with Yarek, what does your day job involve? I think it's, it's often easier to say what it doesn't involve, but my role is I'm a professional lead in learning disability nursing, part of the future nurse curriculum. What that means is I'm a, I'm a qualified nurse and I work in higher education institution. Uh, one of my sort of sideline passions is I'm also a international coordinator for student exchanges, nursing student exchanges, um, so that our students can go and spend some time in Spain or Finland or Norway as part of their training. And I'm also very passionate about digital learning and teaching. So I'm a digital champion in our school. Thanks, Yarek. Um, this is um, fascinating and very interesting, and I would love to talk to you about more about the, your day job, but we are going to find a little bit about Sharon's day job as well and what that involves. Sharon? Hi, yeah. I'm actually a sports scientist, but I work at the in the business school at present. There's a little bit of crossover between you know personal development and what I do. I mainly teach on the chartered management degree course where I teach managers uh, about communication, about people interactions, a little bit of psychology, uh, and that's the main job role. It involves lots of hours, but that's that's the key to it. Yeah, I think we'll get get onto the hours a little later. I'm sure. Um, and, and the same same for Yarek. When I initially um, asked Yarek this question in preparation for the podcast, uh, he said it would be easier to say what I don't do. Um, so we'll we'll kind of get onto that. However. We are not here to talk about the day job in a so far as we are interested in uh, Sharon and Yarek's serious leisure pursuit, ultra running. So um, we typically start with our um, origin stories. That's what we call it here on the podcast. How, what are our serious leisure origin stories? So if I may start with Yarek. Um, Yarek, tell us about your journey. Um, I know this um, word has um, more than one meanings in this context, but how did you arrive and get into ultra running? Yeah, I think it's it's been a, a journey over many, many, many years. I initially um, came over to England in, in 2006 uh, from my home country in Poland. And in the first few years, I wasn't living a particularly healthy lifestyle. So it, it means, you know, far too many takeaways and cakes and not, not not too much activity in general sense of, of the word. And I started putting on weight and I thought, oh, I need to do something about it. So I basically went out and bought a bike, started commuting to work, started feeling better in myself physically and mentally. And 
sort of just started taking it up a notch a little bit and then um, joined a local cycling club, which really encouraged me and motivated me to um, sort of take it more more seriously. Um, and I think thanks to cycling, I visited some really beautiful and scenic parts of the world. I uh, had a chance to cycle in um, Italian mountains, in the French Pyrenees, um, in Mallorca. And one of my biggest challenges that I did on a bike was something called Everesting, where you go up and down the same hill until you accumulate 8,848 meters. And that was just outside Monmouthshire. It took me the best part of 16 hours, I think. Um, and then soon after that, I sort of fell into running in general, did the road marathon. And I just got really attracted to this sort of quite simple, simple sort of sport, which is just you put on your shoes, you put on your shorts, and then you go out the door and you start running. Uh, and that's what really appealed to me. And that sort of was the foundation to my ultra running journey as it is now. Thank you, Eric. Um, this is fascinating. And it's also interesting that you're just saying this is the beginning of the journey. So we'll find out a bit more about that in a moment. Sharon, can you tell us about your origin story and how you got into ultra running? Yeah, I, I had a desire to do the London Marathon many, many years ago. Like all people, you see it on TV, but you don't do anything about it. But eventually, uh, a friend at work actually bought me a pair of running shoes. And that made me feel very guilty. So I started training to do the London Marathon. And when I did it, I'd only ever done 17 miles before I did my very first marathon of 26 miles. And so I didn't actually know that I could do it. And I wanted to do it and finish, you know, do it all running. So I did actually finish it, uh, 26 miles, and I ran every step of the way. And it still remains the most emotional marathon of my entire career. And I've done about 450 of them. Um, but I love that, that feeling of going further than I'd ever run before. So once I'd done the marathon, I actually stopped running because I hadn't set a goal. Uh, and eventually I moved from Cambridge up to the northeast and I, I combined it with my other love of hill walking. And there was a 50 mile event in the North York Moors and it was a new challenge, you know, a distance I'd never done. And so with barely hardly any training, I went and did a 50 mile event. And yeah, I finished it. I got lost many times and I finished third lady. Um, not that that had any relevance. And it was 1993 that the uh, Long Distance Walkers Association have a 100-mile event uh, somewhere different every year. And in 1993, it came to North Yorkshire, just down the road from where I lived. So it was the ultimate challenge to me. Nice round figure, 100 miles, day, night. And it was a new challenge, a new distance, and it was all over the North York Moors. So I did that event uh, purely by chance because it happened to be there. It was on my doorstep. You know, if it hadn't come to North Yorkshire that year, who knows if I'd have started it. But, yeah, so I went and did this 100-mile event and had no ideas what to expect. And I come fifth of about 500 people. And I realized I wasn't too bad at this stuff. So the following year, I entered the national championships for 100K, 24 hours, got myself ranked number seven in the world, uh, took a gold medal at both those medals and got international status. And um, that was the start of my ultra running career. Thanks, Sharon. Um, if you're listening to this and you you're feeling a little bit inadequate. I think you're not alone. Um, that's, yeah, Kat is pointing at herself and, and, and nodding vigorously. Um, that is just um, so impressive. Um, so um, I, um, I have to admit the only thing I've ever run is a 5k run and that was about 100 years ago. <laughs> and I think I did it and I was like, I might not do this again. So um, I have all kinds of admiration and respect for both of, of, of you, um, Sharon and, and the Eric. I want to pick one aspect about what both of you talked about. And that is the space. You both started talking about the different locations and the, the, the appeal of the different locations where these runs were taking place. Um, and can I just unpack with you just the importance of, of space um, in, in that respect? Um, Yarek? Yeah, sure, Petya. I think it's, it's really interesting because I think going back to my cycling years, I think what I was always really attracted by was the Grand Tour, so the Giro d'Italia, the Tour de France, the Vuelta Espana, and having an opportunity to go and ride the same roads felt to me like, you know, if I was a tennis player, I can go and play centre stage, you know, Roland Garros and, and play on play at the Wimbledon. Or if I was a football player, can I go and play at Wembley, for example? And I think with, with road cycling, I felt this sort of like 
magnetic pull to say, I want to go and ride the Mortirolo where Marco Pantani and Lance Armstrong are riding and, and, and have an opportunity to do this and experiencing what they were experiencing it, it sort of um, relating to that. And I think then when I switched to running also, it, it's interesting because a lot of those events, ultramarathons take place in some very exotic, some very remote locations. Um, although not necessarily that that's necessarily the the attraction or the the main attraction of it because I, I remember one of my f the most memorable sunrises was actually in Brecon Beacons and there was this cloud inversion in the valley and that memory is going to stay with me forever um, and some of the other ones where I was running through a valley in Oman in the Middle East during the race and there was this golden hour and the the sort of the sunset was just coming down and the shade of the mountains was just so spectacular. You, you sort of try and like, you, you want to bottle it and, and sort of keep hold of it forever. But I think it takes you running and, and, and cycling and, and endurance pursuit takes you to places where people won't necessarily frequent or won't necessarily have an opportunity to experience just even from the perspective of culture and um, the communities that you're coming across. Um, I think that is a very strong attraction in terms of experiencing those environments, those landscapes and those places. So that's what the appeal of ultra running is for me. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm not sure about the listeners, but gosh, that was so beautifully described. <laughs> you kind of took, took us all, all, all there with, with that those vistas. Um, and... I am with bated breath uh, waiting to see what Sharon is going to tell us about her experiences of different spaces that she's been uh, running. Sharon. Yeah, uh, very similar to Yarrick. Um, I've run all over the world. I've run in every kind of environment and every environment is a new experience, something new to experience. You know, I've run across Iceland, which, OK, wasn't so remote, but I have re run in the most remote places in the world. I've run across the Libyan desert and anyone that has ne most people would never have been to the Libyan desert. And the landscape just changes. You know, it's it was it was my first desert race and it will always remain the most amazing desert race I think I've ever done. You know, the rock formations that have come out of the sand are beyond belief and you can't travel on a vehicle to go and see these. You have to be on foot. The colour just changes, the colour of the sand from red sand to white sand, even black sand. And when you go on the, the plateaus, you know, it goes from deep purple to like black marble and you hardly dare put your foot, you know, your foot on it because you think you're going to leave a footprint. But those are some of the desert races. But I ran some of the world's extreme races. I ran across Death Valley in the Badwater race, which is the world's hottest race where it actually does melt shoes. I run in the world's highest race through the Himalayas. I run across Hawaii. I run through... The Grand Canyon and a bit like Yarrick, you know, being at one with nature, you know, like when you're sleeping in, in these places and there's tarantulas and scorpions and, and camel spiders that follow you everywhere and snakes and, and deserts. I've seen the biggest rats I've ever seen in the deserts. I, I honestly didn't think they were rats, but um, yeah, I thought they were the animals of some kind. But yeah, I was reassured they really are rats. But yeah, you've never seen anything till you've seen a rat in the desert. But yeah, I've, I've been to some amazing places and I just love the experience of being there. And the best way to see a country is to run across it. And I've run across many countries too, you know, Slovenia in the middle of the winter, the mountains are just so beautiful. Um, I've run across the Alps from Italy, uh, from Germany to Austria, to Switzerland, to Italy. I've walked in Thailand to the Pyrenees and I just love the journey runs and the experiences you get. And you really get to see the countries when you do these things. Uh, thanks, Sharon. <laughs> this is um, fascinating. Um, it's really interesting um, that both of you talk about these destinations with um, kind of love, interest, appeal, um, almost as existential pleasure that you're experiencing um, in in these uh, these two two locations, and and that's just I find that so fascinating. Um, Yarek, do you want to come in here? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting when listening to what Sharon had to say. I think when you are going through those environments, you feel tiny, you feel so little, and you feel vulnerable to a degree. But 
you're also sort of acknowledging the limitations of your own capabilities and, and obviously the events that happened in China just recently, uh, really tragic events with 21 um, people dying during an ultra marathon. I think just makes you realize that I'm so um, exposed to a degree, but when you're going through all of these experiences and having all of these memories and you're looking back at them, you think like I'm just a, a really small part of the whole world and and it is existential and it is philosophical to a degree as well cat you want to come in i just wondered in particular listening to these amazing descriptions that you've both given of some of the things that you've seen during your during your time doing your sport um for you is is there a sense in which actually the act of running in these places though is giving you a unique perspective because as you're describing you think wow i'd love to see that and then imagining, as I picture myself in the places you've described, I am clearly walking, I'm not running. Um, and I wonder that if, if there's a particular experience of going through the physical hardship and endurance and push that you're achieving, uh, whether that, do you feel that connects you perhaps even more with the landscape and, and nature that you're interacting with? I, I don't know whether I'm shooting in the dark here, but because it's something I, know, I don't think I'll ever experience for myself, um, I, as I hear the amazing athletic achievements that you've got to, I'd really love to know what is that unique experience to be pushing yourself so hard in, amongst that beauty? I think it's, it's an interesting point because I remember one of those, um, I, was, I was out training in, in Chamonix Valley and there is a very spectacular, uh, which is called a vertical kilometre course. So basically you have to ascend 1000 metres in a space of less than three miles. And towards the end of that course, I remember my breathing. I remember the state I was in. And once I got to the top and I turned back and I looked down at the valley, I know that I've experienced it differently than people who came up over the cable car. And because that exhaustion and being at one with your body and being at one with your um, sort of thoughts and trying to push yourself to the limit and being on the red line and you feel like your heart's going to jump out of your chest and then you get to the end you're looking back and you're thinking like wow I nearly fell over because it, it, it's just it, it's so overwhelming to a degree as well that without the context of doing the physical activity yes you would never have the same sensations you would never have the same experience if you were just to get there on a car and get out and you're like oh okay that's good i'm just gonna get back in the car and then drive down the valley that's not what we signed up to do sharon did you want to come in there yeah very similar but you know i can sort of relate an experience to like maybe the grand canyon you know most people either drive there to the edge of it and look into it a few people will fly over it in a in a helicopter and then there's people like me that actually run down into it and run into it for seven days sleep there for seven days then climb out and the places that you get to on foot you can't see from a helicopter from the edge you know when you run through some of the slot canyons the colors are just amazing it's just like striated different colors and you're running through these you know the bottom of a, a kind of like a it's almost like a ravine and it's like you know just sheer cliff side to side and the colors and you know you can't experience that on a vehicle you have to be on foot and usually for me that it completely I forget that I'm running. I'm just looking around where I am and, you know, exhaustion doesn't really come into it. You know, you're just in this beautiful place and like, I'm just grateful that I can run and I can see these places that other people just never get to see. And that's what makes me feel lucky. And even like Yarrick was saying earlier about like in the Brecon Beacons, nice and local. My next race is going to be along the Pennine Way in the Spine Race in about three weeks time. And OK, it's the Pennine Way, it's UK. I've just wrecked this and you know, what? I've forgotten how remote that is. And I almost hate coming down into the little villages like Hawes and Hebden Bridge. And, you know, I'd rather be out there in the hills and like forget that the world exists. And it was lovely to be away from the computer for two weeks, too. But, yeah, <laughs> you forget about technology when you're in these places. It's banned in a lot of the places I go to, which is fantastic. Thanks, Sharon. Um... I keep saying this is fascinating. I need to find a different word here to express how, how fascinating and interesting I'm, I'm, I'm finding this. Just, I would like both of you to talk me through the process. So you're going to these fantastic places. You're experiencing these um, um, 
beautiful places and vistas. Um, and then you finish a race. Um, now, Sharon, you talked about the Grand Canyon and you, how fascinating it was. You finish a race, but I suspect what you're thinking once you finish that race is like, it isn't, oh, this was lovely. I would like to see this again. Is the thinking, I would like to see another place. How, just talk me to the, the thought process once you finish and experience one place. What yeah. happens next? What, what does your brain tell you? Yeah, most people think, you know, when you finish a race, the organiser will always ask you, are you going to come back again next year? And of course, I love every race I do, but I would rather go somewhere different, see something different. Uh, you know, I've seen this place now, so why do I want to come in and see it again when there's so many other places I've never seen? So I prefer to do different races. And it's like people ask me, what is your favourite race? There is, for me, there isn't a favourite race because every race is unique. Every race is different. You know, every place you see the sunset, the sunrise, it's just absolutely amazing. I think I think Iceland's got to be the best for the, the best sunset and sunrise, I might add, and the, the, the vistas there. But um, once you finish a race, you have to set a new goal and you set the challenge for the next race. Um, so it's usually within a week of coming back from one, I will already have the next race in place. But often I will set a plan at the start of the year, what my races are for that year and then go and do them. And that's usually what I do at the end of the year. Thanks, Sharon. I'm really interested in the words you just used. Once you finish a race, you have to <laughs> have another race. How? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you do. Because the story long ago, when I did the London Marathon, when I finished, I'd set a goal, I'd gone and achieved it. And then I sat and twiddled my thumbs because I didn't really know what to do. And if you finish a race, well, what's next? You know, you've, you've got to have something to look forward to, to aim at. And training for me has to have a purpose. And the race at the end is is the reward. You know, the training is the I'd say I would like to say mundane, but I do enjoy my training. But the training is the mundane bit. And the, the, the race itself is what you put everything into and then go and experience. And I love those experiences. I absolutely thoroughly enjoy every experience, even though they hurt. I still absolutely love them. Um, and so. If I didn't have another goal, another race, you know, I just got nothing to look forward to. Uh, and I'd be like that and I'd be sitting and twiddling my thumbs again. So, um, no, I have to set another goal. I have to set another race. So, yeah, yeah. COVID has been pretty mean because it cancelled all my races. Yarrick has commented here in the chat um, that uh, that, set, that goal setting is, is really, really motivational. Yarrick, do you want to just explain a bit about that for us from your perspective? Yeah, sure, Kat. And, and you know, there's so many similarities between me and Sharon is that you look at sort of the events across the year, what sort of events you're going to be doing and when, how, are, how is one event progressing to the next one and, and how is your training aligning with that? And there's a bit of a mantra with runners is, you know, train hard, race easy, is that I think for many people, they see our participation or winning of the events as the, the sort of the objective, but actually is all of the weeks and hours of preparation in the run up to the event. And like Sharon was saying, you know, if, if I didn't have a, a calendar of events, some shorter, some longer, some hillier, some less hilly, some locally, some nationally, some international events, that that's what sort of revolves around that pursuit and, and, and improvement. So I suppose I'm struck by a kind of spirit of adventure that both of you are describing, both in terms of how you structure your leisure, but also what the leisure is itself. I wonder whether we could hear a bit about the world of ultra running and whether this spirit of adventure that you guys have described is a defining feature of that social world of elite athletes who are doing the kind of sport that you're doing. I'm just, it's interesting that the, the sport itself requires a huge amount of you know, resilience and fortitude. And also interestingly, then your approach is extremely driven, right? I've done, an in, I've done this enormous achievement. What's next? I'm gonna find out what's next. So I'm scheduling to do it. Could you tell us a bit about the social world and about the sort of culture of ultra running? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because I think, you know, I, I quite often would be on the start line and I won't know if I'm going to finish the event. I won't know if I'm going to place well in the event, but I know 
that everyone's going to go through sort of similar ups and downs as I am, no matter if you're the first, the tenth, the hundredth, the thousandth person. And I think that's what unites us is being able to relate to one another, that we all had to sacrifice family time, um, you know, watch net, the new Netflix series or, or whatever it is. And we made those decisions consciously in order to prepare us for that event. And I think, you know, we, we really bounce off each other in terms of the energy. And I remember uh, in one of the races in Oman, I partnered up with a, a runner from Germany that I've never, ever met. And we spent about four hours on the trail together, just supporting each other and sparing each other on. And to be honest, I think ultimately at the finish line, although I came so 45 minutes ahead of him, we met and we said, you know what, without each other's companies, we don't think we would have performed as well as we did. And I think beyond a certain distance, it doesn't, it's not a race against me and you, it's a race against the event or the challenge. And that's where the adventure, I think, comes from. Sharon, I can see you nodding to that. Sam, did you want to jump in? Yeah, it, I, I was waiting for that. That was the bit that I was waiting for. So a key feature of Serious Leisure Pursuits, particularly when you're talking about something like this, you know, in terms of the, the sporting pursuits, particularly, you know, the, the, the thrills and the psychological and physical challenge are, are distinctive features of that, you know, and that's different for, you know, uh, there's research around mountain biking and mountain scrambling and climbing and, and all, all of that, you know, and you can see similarities in how you're both talking about the, the idea of challenge and what I like is the, the idea of challenge, not necessarily just being why well, it's challenging myself to do better, although that's in there. It's also, you know, the landscape itself is part of that challenge. Yeah, so it, it, it's the challenge is, 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 is two way, you know, so it's uh, in Sharon's point is it, there isn't my favorite. It's the next race. That's my favorite race, you know, because it's that, OK, I need something else. I need I need that. So I'm just wondering. If you could explain a bit and, and whether that then is a defining feature of that of that social world as well you know is that shared is that a shared view yeah if i can pop in there yeah the the ultra running community is one of the most supportive communities you will have out there and it's a difference i find between say going a 5k 10k ace or even a marathon you go there you do the race you finish you go home an ultra race is incredibly different you know, people will have, like Yarrick says, the highs and lows. And you don't just do your own race. You support those runners around you. Um, it's a really big community. I said I'm out there supporting somebody this weekend in a big ultra. It's one of those where you're allowed to support. But I won't just be supporting the guy that I'm there to support. Any of the runners that come by before my, my runner and even after my runner, I will make sure they're all OK and there's nothing they need. And likewise, when I'm in a race... Um, I've had other people's support groups. Do you need anything? Do you want anything? And they offer me things. And it's not a race against other competitors. The race is against yourself. It's a challenge to yourself to finish. Uh, I like the way, like when earlier when we were talking to Yarrick and he said, yeah, I was born the year you did your first marathon and, and my long longevity. Well, obviously I am a, a little bit older on the on the scale of this and I've passed my best you know I've passed my sell by date is the way I put it but I'm still able to compete and I'm still able to finish these races and when you've kind of like you're beyond where you know you're not going to improve anymore you know age is a factor I'm not going to improve anymore but I still like to do these challenges and what is it that gives me that I still have that desire to go and do these things and okay for many years I've won many races and I still do win a few here and there but the goal of the next race is 268 miles. Now, I'm not bothered whether I win it or come stone bunkers last, the same as most people in that race. The challenge is the 268 miles, the weather, the hills, the sleep deprivation, managing yourself and experiencing the entire event. And experiencing that, the only people that, that understand you are the other runners in the field because they go through the same experiences as you. The crew don't quite go through that the same way as you do. If I can just jump in on the point that Sharon just mentioned, it's interesting because the the ultra running community, and I, I just recently started experiencing this, um, there is something that's commonly referred to as dot watching. 
and I was just going to pop it in a chat box because at many of those events, uh, every runner has a, a, a GPS tracker which gives their live location in terms of where they are in the race so that everyone from home can log in. And especially for something like 268 miles, that's going to take a number of days. But you can log in at any point and see, oh, I wonder how Sharon's doing. Let me just check where she is on the map and where she is, how far she's going. Is she moving? Is she sleeping? And it's so funny because my mom, she lives in Poland, obviously. I remember one of my first ultra races, she stayed up. She was doing basically a, 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 an ultra version of staying up awake. I think she stayed up for something like 14 hours, well into the night, just watching this dot moving at three miles an hour. And I think at some point I uh, it wasn't updating and she's got some sort of quite scared saying like, oh, perhaps he injured himself, perhaps he fell over. And then I moved again and she started, she texted me saying, oh, you're doing so well, you're in this place and you, you, know, you don't have far to go. But it actually allows people that, you know, can't travel and can't go to all of these locations to be there on the start line to feel like they're a part of that. And I think to some of us, that also spurs us on to say, I know there is a family back home. I know there is my local running club that is watching behind me and actually trying to motivate me. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. And, and what I like particularly about it is we're getting into the realms of obviously the, 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 the social world is important and the community, the support, you know, and it is very distinctive to other sporting communities that I'm aware of, um, which are very, you know, even um, kind of occasional short lived, but this is certainly something that endures. But we're starting to get into the into the space where uh, hopefully the listeners can hear it in how Sharon and Yarek are talking around you know incrementally over time how something becomes more serious you know so Sharon's uh, early experiences back in the 80s uh, or the 90s might be doing a disservice there Sharon uh, no but back, back in the 80s um, where you know it was just it was just the first challenge but then there was the next challenge and the next challenge so that incremental development and the motivation that then so it, it, uh, in the in the in the literature, it's called incremental motivation. So, you know, those those immediate goals are met. So then it's about the next goal and about the next goal, you know. And then you grow into into that. But then the next observation for me is actually it occurs to me listening to you that actually running is a very small part of this. You know, there's you know the running is the is almost the vehicle for everything else that you're talking about. And I just wonder whether you could comment on that or whether I'm just hearing things. Yeah, if I can start with that, um, you know, the story is I went from a marathon to 50 miles to 100 miles and you don't know what you're ultimately capable of. And yeah, I've run the length of the country, Land's End, John O'Groats, you can't do anything longer in this country. Um, and when you reach the longest thing and broke the world record twice doing it, I might add. Um, but, you know, when you the furthest you've ever run is 140 miles and you suddenly go up to 840 miles you don't just declare it to the world you're going to break the world record doing it you do it but then what do you do once you've done the biggest race of your life the hardest thing of your life the longest thing of your life and the first thing the journalist says to you what's next Sharon so you have to have a new challenge but I can't go longer it was 840 miles you know <laughs> what's next run away on the world but so you have to have a new challenge, but it's not necessarily longer. So I tried to put in more uh, different factors. So that's when I went more extreme, you know, the world's highest, the world's hottest, uh, the world's most remote. And, and even now, like I say, I'm just trying to find a different angle, a different challenge. Kat? Sharon, I'm, I'm really fascinated to know whether you believed that you were going to be able to do it at each stage. And if you didn't, how did you reach for that? I never know that I am going to do it. You know, like when I stepped up to do Land's End to John O'Groats and the furthest I'd ever run was 140 miles and I was going to run 840 miles. I didn't know that I could do it. It's like that very first marathon, stepping up from 17 to 26 miles, from 26 to 50. You don't know you can do it. And when you step into some of the extreme races, the world's highest race at altitude, it, it nearly killed me. It nearly did. <laughs> um, the first time that race was held, one person finished, the end. The rest ended up in hospital. So, yeah, it was a scary race. Um, so you don't know you can finish is the answer. But that's the challenge because you go into it and there's always features, you know, injury can happen, anything can happen in the race that, that you sometimes you don't finish and, you know, you don't know that you can finish. But that's the challenge, you know, like if you don't challenge yourself, you, you know, that's part of it. You know, you go into something that is going to be hard. 
is a challenge and that's the enjoyment of it too. Sam, did you want to come in? Yeah, I'm uh, okay. I'm really interested in the, this idea of challenge. We'll, we'll get, we'll maybe go over the top here and, and this idea of challenge, but it's we, we've established it's multifaceted. We've established, you know, seeking it out in different ways, and and the running is just a vehicle for that next challenge, right? But in the context of your own work life well being balance. Is the source of that challenge important? I mean, obviously, you're not going to get that the nature of that challenge anywhere else. But you know, how how does that relationship work for your for you both? Yeah, in terms of that challenge, there's professional challenge, but then there's the challenge that we're talking about, which is very very different. Yeah, yeah Sam, I think it's an interesting observation because I think doing what we're doing also allows us to develop a lot more skills which support us in our daily jobs and I think you know one of the things that Sharon mentioned there is about you know you've got this big project how do you go about actually delivering that project okay you're going to break it down in stages you're going to identify what is going to you know be the the, the enabler and and what's going to be the issue here and 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 trying to break that down and a lot of these things around resilience and growth and and coaching y- yourself can be applied to many other roles that we embed. But I think the I, I find that quite often if I do go out for a run and I have, you know, I had a hard day at work and I've got things going on in my head, that sometimes I arrive with some really um, good solutions to the problems that I'm facing. And then you come back home and you're like, oh, it's, it's like the weight's lifted off your shoulders. Like I had time to be out in the nature, get some, you know, blood circulation going into my brain, thought about this, okay, this is what I'm going to have to do tomorrow. I always write it down because inevitably tomorrow when it comes, I'm like, what was the thing I thought about when I was out running? Oh, no, I forgot it. So <laughs> it's it's a case of just making note of that and, 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 and remembering it. But yeah, you know, big part of my identity is the fact that I'm that crazy ultra runner guy that does these crazy challenges and I'm to a lot to a lot of people that are in my um circle of friends I'm not known as a an academic or a lecturer or a member of university and and, and I think that is too faceted oh, I was just laughing at that last comment about I'm I'm just this ultra runner and everything else and I remember one of my my students at university when I came in one day it was a new group I was teaching and uh, he was quite a mature guy that came in and he just sat, sat in the classroom and stared at me. And it, I, I didn't know what his problem was. Are you okay there? You know, Kevin, I said. And he, what are you doing teaching? You're an ultra runner. I knew you was associated with Teesside University, but I didn't realise you actually taught here. You know, I just thought there was some connection with the university. I didn't realise this was my day job. You know, they sometimes think I'm this big person put on a pedestal and I don't work. I'm this sponsored athlete. So, um, that was one of my students once because I am such an ultra runner, you know, but uh, yeah, so we soon learned and um, we're still best of friends, me and Kevin. <laughs> but again, going back to the first question of like breaking it down into bite-sized chunks, everything gets broken down into chunks um, the way you actually run an ultra. You know, I never stand on the start line and think of the finish line. I always think of those little sections and you have to achieve each little section to get to the next section. Uh, and even like the race that the next race I've got, Pennine Way, I mean, there's, it's roughly 50 miles between checkpoints. Uh, and that's a big chunk to think about 50 miles before you're going to get sort of any support. So you have to, you know, through the recce, it was like, OK, you break it down into the next time you cross a road. That's probably about 10 miles and the next big hill. And that's how you break that down for me. Um, and even some of the world record attempts. And I've done some really boring world records, I might add. You know, when you run on a treadmill for seven days and. I didn't think the women's record was a big enough challenge. So I set the record of breaking the men's world record. And yeah, I took added 100 miles to the women's and 50 miles to the men's world record. And all over the world, the men still haven't got me back. They're very, very close. But I set the goal very high as well. And I broke that down into manageable chunks of three hours. Before I pass on back to Sam to continue with the substantive discussion, can I just pause and note for the audience that Shannon referred to a boring world record, which I just find as a concept quite hilarious. Um, so I, um, 
Not to sell possible title for this podcast, A Boring World Record. <laughs> Sam, can I give this back to you for a more serious yeah. comment? Just for the record as well, you should try working with Sharon. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> talk about social comparison, you know. Anyway, um, no, I, what I'm what I'm really interested in here in this particular hook, um, we're talking about challenge, we're talking about, but you've both mentioned identity and actually you know, that's a big part of serious leisure, you know, for the formation and the affirmation of uh, a sense of attachment and identity with the core activity I, of running, but we've established even that is, is quite a complex thing. But also the interplay then between, and Sharon's anecdotes really interesting in this respect, in terms of the interplay between that leisure identity and our professional identities. You're both known not as an academic, but actually as ultra runners or ultra athletes. Um, and I just wonder, in your own minds, how does that play out and, and, and what wins out, I guess, in the end, although I probably could guess. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, Sam. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point because I had an experience where um, about three years ago now, I, I was out injured for on, on two occasions within a space of approximately six months. Um, I was out racing in Snowdonia and I uh, fell over and I had a um, hip injury which put me out for about three months and I couldn't, I couldn't really exercise. I couldn't even do um, stationary bike or, or couldn't really do anything. So I had to go through a rehabilitation process. And I felt like a big, big part of me was missing to a degree. And I, and I felt I was sort of re reflecting on it and thinking, hang on, if I'm not running, what am I doing? And it was really interesting, even looking back through my time when I never did any, sports or, or endurance sports I was thinking like hang on what was I filling my time with what was I doing with all of this time not having any other hobbies or passions and I think that injury period really allowed me to think that you know I still want to do a little bit of cycling and, and majority of it will be running but that identity is so strongly related to me being able physically able to engage with those activities and the whole community that comes with it Okay, so I'll step in now. And, and in terms of, for me, I'm an ultra runner first and a lecturer second, no two ways. Um, eventually, I will retire from teaching and being a lecturer, but I don't think I'll ever retire from running. Um, I'd like to think that when I'm in my 70s and 80s, I don't quite know that I'll be doing ultra distance running, but I'll still be out there running. That, for me, is gold dust. That is, the, you know, that, that's, that dynamic there between, you know, who I see what role for leisure and what role for professional work you know and i think this is right at the heart of the podcast as, as we've been exploring you know the the, the tension between work life uh, and, and how we try and shape our own kind of leisure lifestyles um and that value base and i think that's really really interesting you know i, I, I made a comment uh, earlier on that this is something that is a recurrent theme across our podcasts how this identity work through our leisure is sometimes it's escapism, sometimes it's a, a expansionism in terms of, uh, you know, oh, we can't do this over here, but oh, I re you know, but for me at the heart of all of this is a sense of authenticity. This is, this is where you feel most authentically yourself. And your, your, your point there is when I'm not doing this, a large part of me is missing. And I think, you know, that's something that, you know, certainly in the absence of it, as Sharon's made the point, you know, COVID's taken some of that away. You know, that's really, you know, so I think we're, we're all kind of in that space at the moment. But, you know, that author, so the authenticity plays a big part in this as well for me. Thanks, Sam. Um, it's, it's, it's often interesting how at the end of the each episode, we kind of come full circle to the origins of the podcast. Um, and it really makes me think about for those of us, um, and I was one of these, <laughs> these people that I'm just going to refer to um, for, for a very long time where our whole identities are wedded to our professional identities. And ver there's very little outside of our professional identities. Um, the language that you use, Sam, is like, what parts of ourselves are we missing that we haven't discovered yet? that can enrich ourselves and our lives by discovering the serious as a pursuit that's the right one for us. 
Um, so that I find that, that that just really brings us nicely to, to reflecting on that and, and thinking, how can we enrich our lives and find other identities that we can kind of fully enjoy or enjoy life in a different way and more fully um, and more richly. Um, so, um, so thanks, thanks for saying that, Sam. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that just quickly and the legitimization of that pursuit. That's a really, really big thing for me. It's the, yeah, it's a legitimate, it is absolutely right and fine that I should be doing this. You know, and that's the authenticity piece for me. There's so much of what we do, certainly in academia, which, you know, we might say, well, some of us don't have the, the perspective perhaps that Sharon has, or, or maybe the, I would even say the courage to say, you know, well, I'm this first, this is just a means to an end, the end being what I'm doing over here. And I think that in itself is, is a lovely point of difference for listeners on this podcast, just as a reflection point, you know, to consider, consider that in your own context, your own, your own work life tensions and struggles. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I think this is an excellent point to end this conversation at. Um, I'm really, really grateful to our guests, Yarek and Sharon, for sharing their fascinating, inspirational, awesome stories. We are all in awe of you. Uh, so thank you so much. And of course, thanks to Kat and Sam for their contributions and questions and comments. Um, this has been really enjoyable and really inspirational. Um, I don't know if I will get into running, but if anything is ever going to get me there, I think it would be this conversation. Uh, so thank you all. Have a lovely Friday. It's, it's, we're recording this on a Friday in anticipation of a bank holiday weekend. So have a lovely bank holiday weekend. Um, I hope our listeners enjoyed our conversation about ultra running, serious leisure, work life and well-being. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.